ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. This is not the main event. No, this it's is actually what we're not. Calling the summer sidecar. Yes, Ryan came up with the name. Yes. Full credit. <laughs> Ryan Baldwin here with my right hand man sitting in Texarkana, which is actually way farther right than my left hand side, like we would be it's in the very, main studio. Very much, <laughs> very much farther right. But we are happy to be able to do this and uh, just yeah. keep our uh, keep our skills sharp over the summer and get a chance yeah. to talk about some things that have been going on. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, folks, we have Ryan to thanks for this. He texted me and I was like, I'm not going to turn it down. It's fun. Right, so, yeah. you know, why not? Talking sports is fun. We also have special guest Gilbert. Uh, he's being uh, he's being nosy about what's going on today. <laughs> All right. My pets so. are outside, so I can't right. Don't <laughs> bring my dogs in. But right. I do have. What do you get? Ah, oh, yes, Mjolnir. I've got Mjolnir here. So. Yeah, and I'm sure That's you're up. just super hyped about the Love and Thunder. Uh, oh yeah, trailer. <laughs> before we even get into the sports, Let's very, see. very much so. Uh, as I mean, I'm wearing a Dragon Ball super hat, so super yeah. nerd over here. Uh, I got more stuff over there in the corner, but yes, Thor has been one of my all-time favorite characters, whether it's Marvel, DC, whatever. So, um, actually, did a Marvel personality Avengers test, and I matched with Thor. So, it it made me happy. It made my day. There you go. Well, I believe that trailer, the trailer's the segue, because I believe that trailer dropped during the NBA playoffs. Yes, it did. And we'll segue right into the Easy (laughs) segue. See, we had it the whole way. You thought yep. this was non-sports? No, this was sports. No, no, no. I, I had a feeling I was like, he's going to segue <laughs> into this somehow. Uh, so the NBA playoffs, which uh, our little Mavericks ended their season last night uh, against the Golden State Warriors. And yep. uh, look, nobody really expected the Mavs to get here after the Porzingis trade. They, nope. It was, I mean, everyone was like, Porzingis is not that great anyway, so let's get rid of him. And then they brought on Dinwiddie and Bertans, who, to be fair, Bertans has been kind of hit and miss. But Dinwiddie has actually been solid, and I like oh, Dinwiddie been, when I like Dinwiddie when, when I, he was um, on the Nets. Yeah, when I watched, um, I think it was it was Game Two. When I watched Game Two and and watched Spencer Dinwiddie, I was like, "Who is this guy?" Yeah. And like, I knew who he was, obviously, but it was more of like, uh, I mean very good shooter and he plays some pretty good lockdown defense and he's i've seen him he fights for a lot of rebounds which you love from your kind of more smaller guys in the sense of a shooting guard that style um so i was very impressed by him really throughout this entire really uh the 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 games i was more impressed with dinwiddie than i think anybody because luca luca is luca and i think we've gotten to a point on his career we can say that well, the, yes, but we should also acknowledge that Luca is Luca for the good and the bad. Because yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, man, and my if my parents watch this, they are going to bust out laughing because I every time Luca turned around to the ref and was like every single like on almost every single play, I was starting to lose my mind. And my parents are going to laugh because I did the same thing when I was like. 13 14 years old but i was also 13 14 years 14 old 14 years old NBA. yeah uh now granted he's like 22 23 so he's not that much older but still uh his defense Isn't he younger than you yeah oh yeah yeah he's, he's like he, yeah he's like 22 23 but still like there's a there's a big difference between doing it at 14 and doing yeah, it at 23 yeah. now so yes the the attitude needs an adjustment the defense is not there and yeah. As much as I love Jalen Brunson, I don't like Jalen Brunson and Luca on the floor together. Because if you go back and watch the games when they're on the floor together, they're basically the same type of player in the Mavs offense, right? Because the Mavs offense is dribble, penetrate, and either get a good look at two or dish out for a three. Yeah. But they they both do that. They both do it well. But when Jalen Brunson has the ball, Luca just does not move off the ball. If you watch, he just stands there. But so, I mean, so does Jalen Brunson. But, uh, you know, when you compare that to the Warriors and how crisp their ball movement was throughout the whole thing, like Stephen Curry was almost never standing still off the ball. There are so many screens back and forth and movement and getting open looks. And it really just shows you, I think, 
All right. We've had enough. <laughs> uh, how big of a uh, step up the Warriors are from where the Mavericks were. And I actually also think it kind of shows that the Mavs had a good matchup in the first round and that mm-hmm. Phoenix lost more than the Mavs won in the second round. Because yeah. I think that the the Mavs were just outclassed by the Warriors. And I'm not so sure that, you know, I'm not so sure that they didn't get to where they were by being pretty lucky. When you look at how their team functions and how little their entire offense was predicated around making threes. And when they didn't make threes, the games weren't close. Yeah. And I, you know, my, my dad and I, we, we talked about it, especially now more since I'm here with the guy and that's the main sports guy I talked to besides Ryan now. Um, we talked about how the Mavs style of when they were against Phoenix and they're like, Oh, we can pass ball around. We can shoot open threes and make them. We both said that's not going to work when they go against golden state, because it's like what you just said, when you make them, it's great. When you miss them and then they go down the floor, then they shoot threes in your face and they will make them. They got four splash brothers. Yeah. Well, three. So it's just like, it's not a lot of room for it, there was not a lot of room, I think, for the Mavs offense to adjust when they faced Golden State. When they were facing Phoenix, they could – I think when you face a team like Phoenix with the state that Phoenix was in, you can try different things. You can focus more on one aspect of your game, and you can get away with it. Like you said, basically be lucky or have a fluke win in, in, in that sort. But when you face a team like Golden State – and that's the thing. I will say this. We all talk about Golden State. We talk about the three-point shots, the Splash Brothers, and all this other stuff. But one thing they do not get enough credit for, in my opinion, when it comes down to analyzing their game is like what you said, ball movement. The fact that, okay, we got Steph locked down, but Clay's been running all around the floor, so he's open. Oh, if he's not running around, then Draymond's open. Then you got Jordan Poole over here. But even before Poole was even there, you know, I still remember the the 2016 team when it was Curry, Thompson, Durant, Green, and Andrew Bogut in there. And it was like, okay, we've got all these guys like that, but Bogut is still there in the middle. You know, and and whether you think he's a good player or not or was is subject to your opinion. But the fact that the Warriors are a very fluid team, and it's like they played with each other for 20 years. It's like they have mapped out a team to where, okay, I know he's going to be over here. And I know, and almost, especially in basketball, you don't see this a lot in football because you kind of can't. But, excuse me, in basketball, you can have it to where, Because you know how your team works so well, you know what the opponent is going to try to do to you. So as Steph knows, okay, they're going to try to double me when I get to the perimeter. So that means everybody else is going to be more likely to get open than I am. So as soon as the two of them come up on me, or at least they try to come up on me, I'm just going to pass him. He's already going to be open. Boom, splash. And it's just like, how do we stop this? And it's one of those things where it's like, you, you kind of get lucky when you can. We talked about this Monday when, um, when they were able to survive the Mavs and win at least a game, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it won't have the Warriors, and they've made a habit out of doing that. They'll beat a team three zip in the finals, and then it'll be like, oh, the team wins one. They're motivated to get back, and the Warriors just go ahead and finish it yeah, off. Yeah. They they are the masters of doing that. We're going to beat you three zip. We'll let you have one. Then we're going to beat you the final one. And I think that's what makes them. Because everybody, in my opinion, is already predicting them to to win another one. Which, I mean, with the rate that they're playing at, it's not a far-fetched assumption. I think uh, the other thing that the Warriors really do well is because they have such talent on the outside. And you saw it with the Mavs, right? Because the Mavs' inside presence is Dwight Powell. Like, yeah. That's your only – I mean, Kleba's a pretty good defender. But Powell is like the interior defend the like linchpin of the interior defense. Yeah, the Warriors made him a liability on the court to have out there because they are so good at spraying the ball around. He couldn't defend on the perimeter, and so he got like very little playing time. They had to keep taking him out, and then once they Mavs made the adjustment, took Powell out and put smaller uh, a smaller lineup on the floor, they got gashed inside by Wiggins and. Uh, who was the uh, Looney? Uh, the the yep, both Joe those guys. Looney. Yes, both those guys were just gashing through the interior, and it was in a good example of how 
I personally, I think the Mavs got out. Co- I think it was a matchup thing, but I think they also got out coached. I think Jason Kidd didn't have yeah. an answer. And Kerr was like, okay, here's the game plan. We spread it around. We have our good ball movement. We force him to run on defense because Luke is a liability. And if we can get Dwight Powell out on the, in- out the interior and force him to come play, meet us out on the perimeter, then they have no interior defense. Yeah. So I think it was, I think it was, Overall, well done by the Warriors. A well-deserved uh, series win. I can't be frustrated with the Mavs season because I don't think anybody got expected us to get this far. No. But I'm also uh, not sold that this is the kind of team. If you if they were to do the same thing that they did this year, basically, and run it back next year, I don't see this team going any farther than they did this year just based on their performance. Yeah, I think with the Mavs in, in that sense, I've said this for a long time. One of the Mavs' worst qualities, in my opinion, as a team is defensive lockdown situations in the sense of it's like what you just said. You know, our best big man, you could say, is is Dwight Powell. And that's just like, eh, because that's not a big man I would want to be my center. or even not Tyson Chandler. No. Oh, man, Tyson Chandler, those were the days. Um, You know – and I think, and when the Mavs were more successful and they went on more uh, more tolerable runs in the playoffs, you had a Tyson Chandler as a center, you had your Dirk Nowitzki as your power forward. You had, you know, exchanges between, you know, ironically, Jason Kidd was there, but also like J.J. Barea. You had Jason Terry as your shooting guard, something like that. It was more spread out versus, like you said, okay, Brunson and Luca play the same style of yeah. ball. You have Dinwiddie who comes in and off the bench, and he produces well. It was but past that. It's like yeah, it was back in 2011. It was Dirk was your star, and yes. he was going to be able to score. But you knew that he couldn't play defense, and he wasn't athletic. So what do you do? You surround him with a strong, the one of the best interior defenders of the last decade in Tyson Chandler. Yes, you put a lockdown, an actual lockdown, not Maxi Kleba, but a all. NBA defensive team player in Sean Marion to lock down their best player. You put other people on the outside like JJ, uh, JJ Barea, Jason Terry and Zaza Pachulia so that they can have that shooting. And then also JJ Barea could drive. He was deceptively quick. And because he was so small, he was a great drive and dish guy Mm -hmm. who could also potentially score a little bit. So it really was, you had, Dirk was the star, but everybody around him offset his weaknesses. Exactly. And on this team, you don't really see that as much. The game is basically hope Lucas scores 40 and hope everybody else shoots pretty well. Yeah. And which I, in the I, NBA is hard. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. And, you know, if you want my, if, well, obviously, I always want show. your opinion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, you know, in my opinion, I think with Dallas, and I think when you mentioned some, because that statistic even shocked me, even though I already knew it about Sean Marion and where he ranks in all-time defense. I don't think, and it's because of the way the times changed and things happened, but I don't think people stress enough how important defensive play is in basketball. Now, sure, it's easy to say, of course we know it's important. It's how you keep the other team from scoring, whatever. Yeah, but the other team could also have players that go like 0 for 17 and it would have nothing to do with your defense. So it's one of those things where it's like you just summarized, uh, what would you you say, 2011 Mavs, 2011 Mavs type perfectly versus this Mavs. And I think those Mavs with them would kick these Mavs butts now because, like you said. In a best of seven. Yeah, I think if you just do one game. I think maybe the I'd say it's probably about 50 50 because again, yeah, yeah. because if the if the current Mavs hit all their threes it's probably a blowout exactly yeah but if it's a best of seven i would give it to old school mavs uh because like you said there's that offsetting there's that okay this is this guy's job he knows what to do no one expected tyson chandler to go up there and put up 20 10 and 14 he's not that guy no and i think there was a i think and this is going to get a little bit more psychological into psychological aspect of sports but that everybody knew that there was never an interview where Sean Marion was like, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make 30, 12 and 14. He never thought that there was never an interview. Even Dirk, even though he knew he was the star was never like, I'm going to make 40 points. 
they went out there and they thought, but and they knew their role. But it's like what you just talked with Brunson and Luca. Everybody in the Mavs now is okay. How can I score as many points as possible and be the second to Luca? And and it's one of those things. I said this, and I'm going to keep saying it. When the Mavs focus on defense, I think that's when we're going to see better because you can't tell me. And it's obvious because it didn't work. This offensive style of basketball that they're trying to play is going to benefit them in the long run. Like you said, it won't, especially against a team like Golden State. It doesn't help. I think if you have a defensive, like if you have a Sean Marion type, well, like, so look at, so the Warriors can play this style because Draymond Green is a defensive player of the former defensive player of the year. And he yes. is going to be on the best player on the floor. He is going to make them have a hard time. Now, Luca may still get 40, but he's going to get 40 on 25, 30% shooting, which is exactly. not efficient. And then that nope. means the Warriors can make up for that by just doing Warrior things. And now if you look at the Eastern Conference, the Celtics are up 3-2 with the current reigning defense player of the year, Marcus Smart. Nobody expects Marcus Smart and... Like to to your point, nobody expects Marcus Smart and uh, Green to be able to put up 15 points, let alone 20. Yeah. Any offense that you get from them is a bonus. Mm -hmm. But we don't look at that on the maps, right? Because like no. our defensive player was our best defense player was probably Maxi Kleba, yeah, or, or Dorian Finney-Smith. Those two guys, they're not on the same level as the other two as nope. green or uh, smart. And we still expect them this. We, how many times did down the broadcast? Did you hear? Oh man. Finney Smith is one for five shooting. I'm like, well, he, if he's your defensive specialist, have everybody else score. Exactly. You know, and it, it's, it, it, it comes down to, there is not enough balance with, with Dallas, with yeah. the Mavs. There is, there's a heavy emphasis on, okay, we're going to shoot and score. There's not enough emphasis on, okay, we need our defensive specialists to be that, our defensive specialists. Yeah. And here's the thing. Obviously, when you play basketball, it's like people who play – it's like when you play baseball. Um, even though I don't follow it, I still know that even the pitchers have to come up to hit. You know what I mean? When it's their time. Uh, not anymore. Now there's a universal DH. But, yes, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Back, back in the day. It tells you how much baseball I watch. But, but back in the day, even pitchers were expected to go up and hit. And it's one of those things where everybody knew that this is the pitcher. That's not their strong suit. No one was expecting the pitcher to, to hit it out of the park. But when they would, or if they would do something useful, as Ryan put it, it was a bonus. Yeah. There's not that emphasis on the Mavs, really in the NBA, that much, only on certain teams where it's like, okay, we know that this is not what you do. Focus on something else. I mean, you want to bring up the Celtics. One of the best defensive players that I've ever watched growing up was Avery Bradley. It's not just because I'm a Longhorn. It's because he was a phenomenal defensive player. Like, he made first-team All-NBA in, in defense several times because he was that good. And I think it's one of those things where people, I think, especially with the Mavs, really have to focus. But, see, it's like what you said. I've never forgotten this, and it's the truth. Defense does not make sports center. It doesn't make Sports Center. It doesn't make the highlight reels unless a fan makes one because they're that big of a fan of yours. It's the shooting. It's the scoring. It's the dunking. It's all this other stuff. And I think that's where we have a problem, at least with the Mavs organization. It's clearly working for Golden State. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they, they can do this all day like Captain America. But as far as the Mavs, I think they need to – you know, if, if I was Jason Kidd, you know how I would really pay attention to over these last few years? I would pay attention to Pop's team because I feel like that style of, okay, you have your, you know, your Patty Mills, you have your um, Danny Greens, even though they were never expected to put up 30 when their job, but those are your shooters. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got Manu, he's a shooter, but also a facilitator at times, but you have TP. TP gets you 14. That's why he was always called the 14 minute man. Because he would get you 14 points, and you know he, he was not expected to go 20 and 10. It was I'm going to facilitate the ball. Tim Duncan, that's another one of your stars. But even then, Tim Duncan was like he was like uh, he was effective. Don't get me wrong, but that guy was one of the things. It was like buttered. It was like Texas toast, buttered toast, where it's like it's good, it's real good. You could eat like 10 slices of it, but it's buttered toast. It's not like it's an omelet. He's one of the you know most I mean? low maintenance superstars ever. Exactly. Exactly. 
So like, that's what I'm saying. It's not an omelet, it's buttered toast, but it's good nonetheless. But he was still someone you can count on for some points, his defensive presence. Then you had Kawhi Leonard. But even before Kawhi, I would just look at that team as like a blueprint for the Mavs because that's a team who knew what they were there to do. The off the bench guys knew, okay, our stars are on the bench. Let's go out here and keep the game going. Not in the Mavs case. Okay, our stars are on the bench. Let's try our best not to lose. I mean, I would argue you don't even have to look at the Spurs. Just look at 2011 Mavs. I mean, make, keep it in house. Make make Luca your Dirk, because honestly, Luca in terms of athleticism, slightly better than Dirk. I mean, Dirk was just not athletic at all. But if you look at Luca, he's not quick. He's pretty strong, but he doesn't play good defense. He's a good outside shooter and can drive. Doesn't really post up. But I mean, it's a very similar kind of skill set and lack of skills that Dirk and Luca had. Build that team again, Jason Kidd. You were part of that team. Yeah, I think won. that team could still work. Yeah. I think if he, I think if the problem is is trying is finding those pieces. If you can find those pieces, I think it's you're you're good to go. But I don't think that just running back the same team or like flipping Dinwiddie and Bertans or like Bertans for another shooter is just. I don't think it's going to be the the fix it. No, no, I don't either. So that's the Western Conference, the Mavs. Uh, again, a good season overall, but yeah, you know. We'll see how it runs back next season. I'm surprised. I'll be interested to see the moves they make in the off season if they can keep Jalen Brunson because you know he's going to be getting a whole lot of money as a restrict uh, as a free agent. Yeah. Um, and then in the Eastern Conference, as I mentioned, the Celtics up three games to two over the Heat, playing tonight. Um, I think uh, the Celtics have this one because Jimmy Butler is he he looks like he's quitting. I don't know what is going on uh, in Miami. <laughs> But this is the Jimmy Butler special, right? Like, you play really good, then you have an issue with the coaches, and the whole thing just collapses. I I think, and because I've heard people say this, Jimmy Butler, when I was uh, coming up through, and this was more along the lines of of middle school, um, Jimmy Butler, I'm trying to remember the team that he started out on. It's it's been a while. I believe it was Chicago, Um, right? The Bulls? Did he start on the Bulls? Yeah, I... Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, he was a bull. Yeah. So he started, I was just making sure, because he's flipped to other places, so I was just making sure. Um, but he started as a bull. Yeah, he was drafted 30th overall uh, in the 2011 draft 11. by yeah. the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, so when Butler was coming up, you know, this was 2011, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's when Derrick Rose went crazy, and then his knee went out, and then we have Derrick Rose we have now. With Jimmy Butler, everybody knew the potential this guy has, and he still has it. And the reason I still say potential with him, even though this is at least over, it's been a decade since he's been a league, is the fact that Jimmy Butler has one of the worst attitudes when it comes to basketball. And he will never achieve, because I mean, let's face it, you want to talk about, and there's a reason physically, you know, accolade wise, it will always be LeBron and Jordan. But stature-wise, this guy was built from the Michael Jordan school of physique. He's, you know, what is he, like 6'4"? Is he 6'6", six, six like MJ was? Uh, he is listed as 6'7", 230. Yeah, so that is around, in, in, correct me if I'm wrong, that's around Jordan territory. I didn't, I'm, Jordan won 230. Jordan was a little bit, yeah, lighter, but si- I think he, he was 6'5", 6'6", six, 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 yeah. Exactly. So it's not and too so, far off. Exactly. So he had the Jordan build, right? And Butler can do everything on the floor. He's a good defensive player from what I've seen. He's good. To, he's a good defensive player. Obviously, his forte is scoring the basketball and doing all that. And so he, he's explosive. He's got all the tools to be an NBA champion. What's the problem? He can never get along with anybody and he can't get out of his own head in his own way. Yep. And it's just become one of those things. Look, we all make fun of Kevin Durant for being sensitive because he is. Uh, and Kevin, I don't have a Twitter, so you can't badmouth me on Twitter. <laughs> um, but at least Kevin knew, okay, I have to put some of that aside because I want to win. Jimmy Butler is always, okay, no, you crossed me. I don't like you, so I'm just not going to play. He reminds me he is the NBA version of Steve Smith. Even Steve Smith played. But Steve Smith used to get in fights with his teammates and stuff, and it was so counterproductive. 
And I think with Jimmy Butler, it's like, dude, when are you going to get out of your own way? You have a good team. The Heat are a good team. They yep. were the number one overall seed coming into the thing from the Eastern side. But Jimmy just can't get out of his own way. Yeah, I, and li- I'm not sure what goes on in his noggin, but it's definitely <laughs> like, so if you look, so the first two games, 41 points, 29 points. Those are the first two games versus Boston. Win one, lose one. Game okay. three, three for eight, eight points. Played 20 minutes in game three after playing 41 in game uh, one and 33 in game two. Maybe you chalked it up to, you know what? He was carrying and he got, he was tired. Game five, uh, four, 27 minutes, six points on three of 14 shooting. Game five, 40 minutes, 13 points on four of 18 shooting. He looks like he quit. He looks like he's yeah. like, I'm done. I don't, I don't see any other way that you just like, first of all, if you are the star and you're playing only 20 minutes in any playoff game, d- d- uh-uh, you're, you're not a star anymore. Like in a no. playoff. It, now he, I know there have been reports that he has a sore knee, but if you watch him play, it doesn't look like it's affecting him that much in terms of his ability to move or anything. So no. Yeah, and we also have to remember because that this is the truth, and in a lot of cases, sports franchises, television networks, and executives they work together to create a a narrative to where stars that draw you know the game's money and draw in viewership don't come off as bad. Because I'm sorry, but if you're gonna do well in game one and there's no reports of yeah, and remember he's got this sore knee, it's incredible. I was doing all this, but then when you start failing and like you said, giving up. Well, you know, there's been reports he's got a sore knee. And that. No, that's just yep. people trying to cover up for a poor performance. Because no, let's put it this way. No one's going to come out and say, except for people who aren't working for the Heat, that Jimmy Butler has given up. But we saw this in the regular season, uh, you know, with Udonis Haslam. We've seen it countless times. Jimmy Butler is just – he. You know, there's a saying, you know, you can play angry, but don't, you know, bring that over. Because even Udonis Haslam had to tell him, he's like, dude, don't get angry at us. You know, get angry at the other team. You're playing them. You're not playing us. Do do that. Like, you're you're taking this out on us. And I think that's one of the biggest things about Jimmy Butler is he has created. And see, the problem with a player like Jimmy Butler is he goes to these teams where if there is no him, they don't go anywhere or they don't get as far as they they would. And so when he doesn't show up and you just have Tyler Hero and Bam Adebayo, who are, again, good players, I'm not knocking them. You know, they're, they could be considered next level up behind Jimmy. But when it's just them and you don't have your star and you're facing a team like the Celtics, which, I mean, come on, they're already a good defensive team. You don't want to give them any more ammunition. Right. So I, you know, once again, Jimmy can't get out of his own way and the, his team is suffering because of it. And, you know, if the Celtics go on, I would, I would honestly want the Celtics to go on because I would want to see Smart and, and Brown tr- do their defensive specialism against the Golden State Warriors. So yeah. I think that would be a very good matchup. It'd be a really good series. Yeah, you have Smart and Brown um, matching up on Curry and Clay. That still leaves Poole unaccounted for, of course. Yeah, but of course. Then you he also just started out of nowhere. <laughs> but then you also get Draymond Green on uh, Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum. Which is another good uh, good matchup. So I think I bet the uh, – if I was a betting man, I'd put the uh, I'd put the Celtics in the finals after tonight and then yeah. the NBA finals start next Thursday. So, of course, we'll take a look at that next week. Of course, oh, yeah, we're totally going to just not talk about the NBA Finals ever. Just. All right, so what else you got? I know you uh, there. You told me before the show you had, there was some wrestling news. Of yes, of course. And, and no, folks, Jose and Jeremiah are not here. We're not going to do it to Ryan right sure? in the summer, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, well, Jose, you finally showed up. Making um, sure they weren't behind you or anything ready to pop out. from. <laughs> yeah, so um, last week, uh, on, on Monday Night Raw, uh, two women, Naomi and Sasha Banks, they were scheduled to be in a match, and they walked out. They set their tag team titles on Vince McMahon's – well, not Vince McMahon, John Laurinaitis, who's the head executive of talent uh, relations. 
they set their titles on his desk and walked out. And the stories have been that they were not uh, happy with their creative and that they didn't feel like they were being respected. So they walked out. This has happened before with bigger names like Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's walked out. Undertaker storyline has walked out, but more so in realism, Stone Cold. And now um, these two. And one thing that I, I want you to know, Ryan, because I think some members of the audience who watch wrestling know this, but I'm speaking to you here. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that Vince McMahon really hates is when people walk out which anybody would, but he really does because unlike other sports franchises, except that time LeBron left for Miami uh, with, with the Cavaliers owner burying him, the WWE does not take time with people who walk out and they will do whatever it takes to bury you in the public eye. They have talked negative about these women on their live television show. What? <laughs> I was going to say, you should probably throw the Buccaneers in that group because when yeah. Antonio Brown... <laughs> decided yeah. to bounce <laughs> they they didn't take too kindly to that one either that no. just popped into my head but yeah go ahead no that that's no i mean you're right but i think what i'm i'm going for in this is more people who don't deserve that versus someone oh, okay. who did fair but i mean yeah. that's still a good point you know i think more so and this is why it's relevant to all sports is when wrestlers now just like really any athlete now except golfers i guess with pga have control over themselves they are in a sense they have a control over you know for instance lebron can say okay i don't want that player here okay lebron he won't come here you know i know that's more control over a team but for a player to be able to because we both know even when i was growing up in the early 2000s it was still i'm the coach i make the rules or i'm the owner i make the rules you do what i say now that we've grown into where being a star athlete whether you're a wrestler a basketball player football player if you have a big enough brand and you pull in enough money not just with the team but with merchandise sales with television networks and stuff like that you know basically the stuff we're learning in our major if you're a big enough athlete that that's what you can do you control a lot more now than you ever would have back then so you get a lot of these athletes being like no i want to go play here especially in football guys are like no i don't want to play here anymore i have the city or the fans or the owner i don't like them I want to play over here. Wrestlers now, even though the WWE doesn't like it, and they've both been suspended. Their merchandise is nowhere on WWEshot.com. We don't know what's going to go on with them. They may go to A. Well, they may go to AEW. I know Sasha. Uh, do you like Star Wars, Ryan? I think yeah, I think I do like Star, Star Wars. Wars guy. Yeah. You watch the Mandalorian? Uh, not all the way through, no. Yeah, well, Sasha Banks was in the Mandalorian, so she's more than likely going to go to Hollywood if WWE is done with her. Naomi, you know, may still stick around, but we don't know. And that's the thing. But to bring it more over to uh, how it relates to all sports, because I don't want to use wrestling terms and jargon because Ryan won't understand that. So I have to be mindful of that because Jeremiah and Jose aren't here. Um, To tie it all into all sports, I mean, let me ask you, what do you think, not about this situation, because again, you don't know wrestling, but about, like I said, athletes being able to now, they can tell owners when they, of course, like they become a star. They can tell owners, no, I'm not doing that. This is what I want to do. Or, see, I don't like the direction you're pushing me. I want to go this way. I th- I think it's okay as long as the players are also held accountable for the actions taken, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you want the praise of bringing somebody in, you also have to take the lumps when you want somebody and it doesn't work out. LeBron James, Russell Westbrook. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I knew he was going there. Well, yeah, you brought up LeBron James and no, there's plenty of other talent available. And he said, no, I wanted Russell Westbrook. And then, but you know, the coach gets fired, the GM's under heat, but really, I mean, let's not, let's not pretend like LeBron James was not a key factor in getting Russell Westbrook there over everybody else. So I think. It's good and bad, right? I think players, especially at the top level, should have some say, depending on the sport too, right? Like you're not going to – maybe you'll ask your offensive lineman uh, if there's an offensive lineman they want to play with, but they're not going to have a say on who the quarterback is, right? Yeah. Um, And vice versa, the quarterback's not going to be able to say, well, I don't want to play with this free safety over here. Go grab this other safety. Like you stick to throwing the football and we'll handle the defense. 
Um, I think Tom Brady would be the only guy who could get away with that. Yes. The the greatest quarterback of all time is probably the only guy where he's yeah. like, I mean, but even, then, it's like I said, even then he probably doesn't deal with the defense. He probably just is like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to throw to this guy or something like that. Um, yeah. Basketball completely different. Cause it's, I mean, your five starters are out there for a majority of the time. Yeah. Um, hockey. I don't think you really get that a whole lot. Um, mostly because in when you're pairing lines and offensive and defensive pairs, chemistry goes a long way into it. So generally you work pretty well with the guys on your line um, because you have the best chemistry and you develop that chemistry over the course of a season or in training camp. Um, yeah. Baseball. Um, I think the thing about baseball with there not being a salary cap is I don't think the owners really care much about what the players say. Because yeah. since there's no salary cap, they're like, if I've got the money, I'm going to go get the best player. And if you don't like it, that, I mean, he's, <laughs> it's like, there's, it's like, I could, if I was on a team and I don't like LeBron and the owner's like, well, I'm getting LeBron, what am I going to do? Yeah. Right. So I think uh, I, in basketball, it's probably the most um, prevalent when something like that happens but i do think the players you know when obj said he wasn't happy um and didn't want to be in new york and went to cleveland and then didn't want to be in cleveland and got traded to the rams worked out for him you know what okay yeah. fine if you want to be vocal about it that's fine but you also have to take you know what comes with that negatively like with uh simmons ben simmons with the 76ers him holding out because he didn't want to be there fine if you don't want to that's fine but don't go trying to claim your money from the yeah. 76ers when you didn't even play you got to take your lumps if you got if you want the freedom that's fine but you can't have your cake and eat it too so that's as fair. long as yeah. you are under as long as athletes are understanding of everything that comes with actually having that um freedom and that extra attention from the media and from the front office i got no problem with it you just can't have yeah. it both ways I think in, with the sport of pro wrestling, it's different because you have creative. And what so what 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 that is, cause I've said it a lot, and I know Ryan's like, okay, I don't know what that is. So creative in pro wrestling is basically, unfortunately, we've gotten to this point where we need him, but the writers of the scripts or the storylines. And when you're dealing with pro wrestling, image is everything. Even now, you know, and I say even now because it's not as popular as it was back then. Because 10 million people were watching Raw every week. Now, barely 2 million people do. So it's definitely hit a steep decline. But with professional wrestling, okay, let, let's put it like this, all right? Let's say um, this is a perfect example. Because uh, you know this guy, you won't know the other guy, but it'll – tell the story of creative and how creative kind of works and how if you're a big enough star, you kind of have creative control and how you and creative can bump heads and whatever. So Stone Cold Steve Austin, our UNT zone, you know, go mean green. Um, exactly. Um, he uh, was scheduled in Los Angeles one night. He was a WWF champion. He was scheduled one night to face Mark Merrow. Mark Merrow had a female manager who was his wife at the time named Sable. One night on Raw, Sable turned on Mark Merrow and power bombed him on the mat, you know, in front of everybody, just picked him up and dropped him. This woman, she was talentless, by the way, but that's besides the point. She, you know, was like a buck 25, obviously. And here's Mark Merrow, he's 220, and then she just picks him up and power bombs him. So, creative wise, Austin goes back to, you know, Vince McMahon and creative and tells them, well, I'm not wrestling him because, again, it's the image. He just got power bombed by a woman. I'm your top star. Why would I wrestle him and go through a break and us have a big match? Because then that would mean I'm not tough. Because if a woman just power bombed him, that means he's weak. So I should have no problem beating him. They cancel the match. You get what I'm saying? It's this image thing, especially when you have a title. It's like, okay, how do I look strong? How do I keep storylines going? How do I keep fans to believe in me? Because there's one thing in wrestling it's been said by Terry Funk, Dory Funk, Jim Cornette, all the greatest minds of wrestling. I can't make you believe in wrestling, but I can make you believe in me. You know, you may not believe wrestling's real, but I'll make you believe I am. And that's something that with wrestlers and when it comes to their creative, it's like in WWE, and this is why they're known as the evil empire, especially 
They really don't give their people any choice. You do what we tell you to do. There's not a lot of freedom. So when you walk out, you get buried. You get buried on the air and such and such and whatever. And that's why fans like me, we rally behind the superstars. We're like, no, we're just going to walk out because the creative is terrible, which it is. And we're not going to do it just because you tell us to do it. So we're leaving. And like you said, you gotta have to take your lumps on that. But I think that's the difference with wrestling versus other sports, because there is no Ben Simmons treatment with those girls from the fans. There is no, hey, you asked for this. So no, you don't deserve your money. You didn't play with wrestling fans in this sport. It's, hey, they're giving you bad creative. Good for you for standing up for yourself and not taking it. So there's there's a difference in that. And I think, well, that's the difference also between individual sport and uh, team sport and team sport. Like when yeah. uh, Serena Williams, uh, there was the uh, story a few years ago when Na- uh, Naomi Osaka won a big tournament against Serena Williams and Serena Williams. I forget the exact thing, but she essentially made it all about her after Naomi had just won this big tournament over her. And she received a bunch of backlash about that for her words and actions. Because and they were saying, you know, you are deserving of it, or you aren't, you know. And they, you know, it's the the in the individual sports, it's much easier to say somebody does or doesn't deserve something because they only affect themselves. Yeah. Right. There is no. I mean, you can. There's no. Well, they may not get along with this person or this person. Like, it's just you in there. So, yeah, I think uh, the individual sports, wrestling, golf, uh, tennis swimming anything like that are always going to be looked at they, they, the athletes are always going to have a different lens put on them than somebody in team sports especially the big team sports whenever you start getting 11 guys on the field like football soccer yeah. or whatever you know it all it the actions of one person become a little less magnified yeah no i agree i think also and that's the interesting thing with about wrestling uh, as a sport it's because it it blurs the line between both because yes wrestling if you're an individual, you're going to get over whether you're in a tag team, a faction, or you're by yourself. So it's primarily individual, but it's an individual's motion that helps the whole company, yeah. that helps everybody else. Well, and you can buy into and love a person without yeah. buying into the company. And that's a lot yeah, easier to do yeah. on the individual level, right? Because, yes. yes, they're trying the WWE is trying to sell you on the WWE, but they do that by selling you on – Wrestlers. The people, yeah. yes. Um, when you are a fan of golf, you are not a. I mean, you might you're not really a fan of the PGA, right? You're a fan yeah. of insert golfer here. Not probably not for Tiger Woods. Not Phil. I was about yeah. to say Phil Mickelson, <laughs> but let's not go with no. Phil right now. No, uh, no, so no, no, you're a fan no, of Tiger not. Woods. You're a fan of Scotty Scheffler. You're a fan of you know these individuals. Even though, like, I don't really care. I'm not like Ooh, PGA. I'm like. All right, Tiger Woods is playing. Let's go. Same thing with like NASCAR or with tennis. You cheer for individuals because you're sold on the individual as opposed to the association. Yeah. And in team sports, you may like a player. It's a lot less rare for somebody to say, I am a team fan because of X person. Yeah. More that, often, true. more often, it's I'm a team fan in spite of X, X person. person. Yeah, no, very true. I think. I will say this. I even think in basketball, you can get away with it a little bit because I know for me, because I'm a LeBron James mark and I admit it. um, I'm a Mavs fan as far as team goes and a Raptors fan for obvious reasons, but I'm not a Cavs fan, but I cheer them on. I cheered them on because who was on there? LeBron. So I think just like you could say everybody in the nineties, even though you had your Knicks fans, Lakers fans, whatever, Everybody was a Bulls fan because of who? Because of Jordan. Because it felt like Jordan winning. I mean, we're not going to count the Detroit fans. Yeah, that, that's a whole <laughs> other thing. That's that was a hate. That was just no. Uh, they they hatred. Really hated him, so we're not going to go with Detroit. But you know, if, you know what I'm saying? It's like that feeling of like, okay, if here's the thing. It was never a feeling of if Jordan wins another title, we're going to be upset. You know what I mean? We get that with Brady, but with Jordan, it was like if he wins, he's the greatest. You know, there, there was no, if he wins, we hate him. Again, we're not, we're excluding Detroit. So it's one of those things where it's like, but no, football, I've never heard someone be like, you know what, I'm a fan of Cam Newton, so I like the Panthers. You know, it's, yeah. it's usually like, I like the Panthers, 
in yeah. spite of Cam Newton or well, because like, of Cam Newton or whatever. All the, like, all the Patriots fans did not jump ship to Tampa Bay. I mean, at least not in that first season. I'm sure some, like, <laughs> now are like, well, but uh, they got Mac Jones. Like, that first season going into it, they weren't like, we're all Bucks fans now because of Tom Brady. No, they're still diehard Patriots fans. Yeah. And they were super jealous that Tom Brady, you're like, you know, thanks, Tom. You're doing a great job over there. Super jealous that you're winning still. But they didn't all of a sudden, like, uh, and, and like maybe maybe the better example is the Cavaliers fans when LeBron left the first time. They n- nobody nobody jumped ship to be a Miami Heat fan in no. Cleveland, burning LeBron James jerseys, and they were still Cavaliers fans. Yeah, they didn't. Nobody hated the Cavaliers. They at least LeBron, initially. They I think it came out later that maybe the the owner wasn't really particularly interested in keeping LeBron around or didn't do as much, but no, that, that, that's what I was saying. Like the owner buried him. Yeah. And, but that you know, first stuff like that. night, everybody was burning his Jersey. Then they were all Cavaliers fans still, despite him having been a part of it and done doing great things for it. So. Yeah. I don't, I will say this. I don't know why basketball fans do that. Burning jerseys. I know. Football fans did that with Colin Kaepernick when they were on the side that didn't agree with whole, what he did. Whole different reason, though. I know, no, but no, no. I, I, I'm, well, I don't, I don't get that because basic rights. But at the same time, that, like you said, that's a whole different reason with with basketball fans. They because they did the same thing to Kevin Durant. Thunder fans were burning his shoes and and his jerseys. I'm like, I don't know why that's their first. Okay, response. but that's because the precedent was with LeBron first. Like LeBron yeah, jumped shit first. And it was just, I think they viewed it as such a betrayal, right? Because he grew up there, yeah. hometown dude. And I think nobody thought that he was going to leave, right? I think it was just one of those things where, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. And then, South like, the way he did it, too, with a big ESPN special, which and I, I was just annoyed because I'm like, really? We need a 30-minute special for the one sentence that is all I really care about, which is, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. Like okay, dude. But, Greatest of all time, man. You can't help it. Sometimes mm, you got to do too much. Dude, we, we're not getting started on that right now. We, no, no. Just, this is I, the summer. I refuse to have the Jordan Lebron conversation. We're this. not having it. First day back <laughs> in the fall, we'll throw it out. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been the summer side card. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, next week we'll talk NBA finals and then, uh, whatever else we come up with, that'll be fun and interesting over the summer, but it is getting into the dog days of sports. So these will probably be a little bit shorter than our typical podcast. Very much shorter. And Very then, uh, moving on as we have this one. Until next week. Bye guys. Peace.